Check a day of packs, you guys feeling all right? Yeah! Nice. So here, here like single player games. Woo! We only got two on the panel? Wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're common wisdom, generally, single player games don't do that well. We're here to talk a little bit about whether or not that's true. And to first introduce who I am, because I'm the first person talking, I look remarkably like that drawing right there. I am Imran Khan, I'm the senior editor at Game Informer magazine. Uh, yay, clap. <laughs> but I'm not that important here. Everyone else to my right is very important. So we're going to start with Thomas Puha, the communications director at Remedy. You guys have played like Alan Wake, Quantum Break, games like that, games that end with ache sounds. This guy helps make them. And he's making... <laughs> Thank you. You're being, being very, very, uh, very, very kind. Well, awesome to be here. Thank you very much for everybody uh, who, who uh, came here. Hopefully, we're going to be entertaining and talking about uh, single player games. Uh, I've been in the industry for about 20 years, uh, but basically my entire lifetime. I was a journalist for a very long time. Started my own video games magazine. Worked in tech on several games, and now I've been at Remedy for the past three years. Very excited to be here. Woo! Now we're going to skip all the way to the end of the table with uh, Koji Igarashi-san, who you might know from a little, some games called like Castlevania and the upcoming Bloodstain. Hello, my name is Koji Igarashi. Uh, please call me Iga, uh, <laughs> producer of uh, Bloodstain Ritual of the Night. And he says, uh, that's it for English for me, so um, you'll be hearing that me from now on. <laughs> so for about 20 years, I worked in the game industry, and I worked in the game industry, and I worked in the game industry, and I worked in the game industry. So I've been in the industry for 20 years, and um, I've been here since um, you know when multiplayer didn't even exist. So um, uh, well, well versed in it, and um, I hope you'll enjoy our talk today. To his left, we have Peter Botholu, the CEO of Lab Zero Games, who you might know from Skullgirls and the upcoming Indivisible. Hey, I'm Peter. Uh, I've been in the industry for a little over 20 years. I started as press, uh, worked through kind of the dregs of the industry for a while, and then I've uh, been at Lab Zero for six years now. I'm very happy to be here. And to his left, we have actually a gaming veteran, someone who, if you, even if you've never played any of his games, you've definitely heard of them, and you've, been, you've played games that have been inspired by his. We have Paul Neurath who has made games like System Shock 2, Ultimate Underworld, and the upcoming Underworld Ascender. Uh, thank you everyone for coming today, and thanks Pax West for setting this up. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've been in the industry for 33 years now, so a little bit. Um, I guess if you're in the industry long enough, you work on a lot of games. Uh, so some of the games folks have probably heard of are the Ultimate Underworlds, uh, System Shock games, Thief games. We're making new versions of those games, some of those games now. Uh, but thanks. So part of this panel is if we're going to talk about single player games, we should celebrate single player games. So why don't we start with uh, Thomas over here. We're gonna, I want to start with you because I know you're the most nervous about talking about this, of the single player games we love. So let's go for you first. Nervous is not, not the right word. There's just so many great single player games uh, throughout, throughout the years so that you, you worked on. Um, so it's really hard to kind of pick, pick out a few. Um, I'd say the game that really ignited my love for video games in general was Super Mario World, which I really think is one of the best games ever made. Mm -hmm. uh, it definitely ranks Super Metroid right up there as well. Uh, and then. Metal Gear Solid, that was something that was just really just... I remember playing the demo at, a, at ECTS in London. I can remember, remember when I played through the demo twice. I just like forgot there was a free open bar. I was like, I didn't care. I was playing <laughs> Metal Gear Solid. It was absolutely incredible. Um, 
And of course, like Uncharted Two, that's another one that kind of is, is, is just does so many things, so many difficult things so well. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on, but there, there's a few. All right, Paul. Um, well, to narrow it down, list of you know a few hundred. Um, you know, focus on narrative-heavy, you know, driven games, single player. The first that I really got into was Zork, text adventure Woo! game, which really opened my eyes. You could tell a story in a game. It wasn't something that before then people were really doing. Um, and then in sort of the role playing and taking that, the Ultimas, particularly Ultima 4, 5, and 6, I think that, that set of telling a story that really engaged you as a player and you had agency. Um, Monkey Island, another classic. <laughs> Um, so I think those are some early games that, for me, kind of informed, hey, you can tell a story in a game, and it can actually be a pretty cool story. It doesn't have to, you don't have to see a movie or read a book to really get engaged in great narrative. All right, Peter, how about you? Uh, so to narrow mine down, I went with the games that I've replayed the most. Um, so those would be uh, Chrono Trigger, and I'm not pandering woo, here, woo, but woo. Castlevania Symphony of the Night. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. And uh, probably a tie between Monkey Island 2 and Day of the Tentacle. <laughs> and Igarashi san, how about the games that have influenced your games? Hi. I like to say that I'm the most of the games. So this is um, something that I keep um, saying uh, a lot of times, and my, my favorite is um, all the series from uh, Legend of Zelda. <laughs> えっと、so when I created um, Castlevania Symphony of the Night, um, Zelda heavily influenced me because during that time, a lot of games uh, heavily relied on the player's skill level, and it just got a lot more like harder and harder each time. And when we play, when I played Zelda, um, it was more of like exploration, being able to feel sort of the game setting and just the narrative was uh, amazing. So that was the reason why I incorporated that into uh, Symphony of the Night. I'm guessing about the reaction some of you guys have heard of some of those games they've mentioned. <laughs> so everyone at this table right now, in terms of where the game industry is, is an independent developer. And that definition has changed a lot over the last couple of years, even the last five years, what you would call an indie is different now than it used to be. So no matter the team size or no matter the budget, no matter all that, everyone here adheres to kind of an indie label. So we're going to talk a little bit about what they think indie means in the modern game development, and why don't we start with Thomas right over here. I mean, Remedy's always been, I mean, we started in 1995 uh, in a basement of, of one of the founders' parents' parents' house, and ever since we've kind of tried to keep hold of the independent, independent spirit um, of, of the company. And as, as you said, like indie, you know, I think by definition means independent. Uh, so we're trying to make or be in a position that you can make your own uh, own own decisions, which is pretty difficult uh, in, in in this industry, especially when you need a lot of money these days to make these games. Um, but for us, it really is just like trying to maintain that creative, independent spirit and, and uh, not try to do the same thing that everybody else has done. <laughs> How much money does it take to watch Twin Peaks a lot? Out of curiosity. <laughs> Sega. How much money does it take to watch Twin Peaks? <laughs> I, I mm. like I would like a lot. <laughs> I'm just saying, some very <laughs> Twin Peaksy. All right, Paul. How about you? What is? You've been in this industry for a very long time. What does independent mean to you now versus what it's meant the entire time you've been here? Well, I think the, 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 the what has not changed to be an indie uh, studio is to have your own voice and really make your own creative decisions of the kind of game you're making for, you know, good, bad, or otherwise. Um, you know, you have your responsibility, you're hoping you're making the right game, but at least it's your decision uh, as an indie studio um, and seeing your vision through. So I think that's the common thread. 
a change has been over recent years is, is to be, uh, if you want to be an indie studio and get a broad you know, distribution and, and reach a larger audience, you know, you need, uh, uh, the budgets have gone up, you know, as they, as they have, you need larger teams, you know, an, uh, an indie studio like ourselves, I mean, we have 30 in-house people now, uh, we also work with outsourced folks, so that's, it's not three or four people in a garage uh, to, to make these kinds of games. Um, and, you know, we partner with, uh, you know, publishers to get the titles out there, um, so we don't try to be our own publisher, and that's, that's a change from years past when you could just, you know, release it yourself on Steam and, and potentially reach a large audience. All right. Peter, you and Lab Zero were kind of heralds of the indie gaming movement. Skullgirls was a big deal, especially in terms of indie fighting games. What do you think indie means to you and to Lab Zero in general? Um, so I think it's kind of fallen to indies to push the industry forward because, um, AAA games have gotten so expensive mm. that it's made the big publishers very, very risk averse in terms of content. And as a result, you see a lot of games, you know, not really standing out or, you know, they have kind of a mold that they have to follow. And because we're lower budget and we're supposed to have this voice, it's kind of on to us to push things forward, I guess in some way so that eventually AAAs can copy our ideas <laughs> and mass market them. Um, and yeah, there are just like a lot of, you know, there's more freedom that comes with it. Um, you know, when we were pitching Indivisible, a friend of mine in BizDev said it was really ballsy of us to have a female person of color as the main character. And, you know, that companies like EA might not go for something like that. But, you know, here we are. Mm. And Igarachi-san, you're new sort of to the indie scene. You, you've previously worked with big publishers. How does it feel to be an independent developer these days? 結構大手からえっと、必ずお客さんに対して物を作っていくという形なんですけれども、インディーの一番大きな意味っていうのは自分たちが何を発信したいかっていうことだと思っていて、まあ、じゃあ僕が作ってるのはインディーなのかっていうと、まず最
daily work when we think about what we're going to say about control is then you go to talk to the game director and then you go to talk to somebody else and they have almost differing views on where we are and if the feature is being worked on or not and that's it never seems to surprise me just how difficult it is to kind of main, maintain that that everybody knows um, where where we're going so when it's a very small team that's a whole lot easier uh, when i was working on my magazine we were like four people sitting in the same crappy basement office we at least everybody kind of knew what was up um, but it, it's there's good sides and, and and bad so when you get the big team like and i talked to bungie a lot about this is like when they get their 750 people or something like team like rolling and things start happening it's pretty pretty awesome but it's very difficult to get there with a smaller team it's just like you can be be more nimble um, and there's a lot of i mean we have a lot of people who worked on you know First Max Payne are still still at Remedy and they kind of reminisce like, oh, when we have 20 people and we didn't shower for days and we were in the studio for like four days in a row. And times have changed. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, I'm pretty curious like what, what your experience is on, on, on this wall. Um, yeah, so uh, for, I, I sold my prior studio to Zynga and I think they had 2,500 people at the studio at that point. Uh, so they would have teams of hundreds of people, you know, three, four hundred people on a project. Very different kinds of games, but nevertheless, at that team size, you, you don't know most of the people on the team. I mean, people walk past you and you don't know who they are for the most part. And so not knowing people on the team. And I think the other thing about large teams is that um, for most people on the team, they have a tiny little defined role. You know, maybe they're animating the eyeballs in our creatures or something like that for the next, you know, year. Um, and it's hard to it's harder to feel like you have a really meaningful input into the game if you you know one of hundreds. Um, so I think what uh, for for Warren and I we we both both really wanted the other side to go with small teams where we have you know dozen two dozen people on a team, everyone knows each other type communication, everyone has a significant role in, in the vision of the project and, and what gets what gets ultimately uh, shared with the the, the fans. Uh, so it just feels much more meaningful, and it's more fun. You know, you don't have all the layers of management to, to sort of work through, and you can just focus on making the game. Yeah, to actually kind of build on something that uh, Paul mentioned about having limited roles, probably the biggest difference is, is that, you know, on smaller teams, people have to wear a lot of hats. So, you know, um, on Indivisible, you know, I run the company, I do payroll, but I've also been working on the story, and I worked on some UI, and, I'm probably gonna do some quest implementation and stuff like that, and like it's just something that you have to do um, on smaller teams. So yeah, that's kind of the biggest thing in my experience. Yurashi-san, eh, to ma, mina san, di hotondo no koto yuwarete shimatta n desu ke, tomo yappari sono chisai team to okina team de tte naru to sono jokou kyouyu no sa ga ichiba okkii to motte mas. De okina team da to mina san no so ishiki o onaji kusuru koto ga kanari muzukashi na to yufu ni o motte ite, sono jokou kyouyu o suru tame no tsuru o dou suru ka to ka tte yu tokoro ni sono, nan desu ka ne, okina, sono, nan desu ka ne, sono, mondai den ga aru to motte mas. De, ano, boku mo, ya no, 4人のチームからやってたこともあるので4人のチームで一番良かったのはやっぱりその後ろを向くだけでそのみんなと話ができてそのみんなの意識を統一化できるっていうことが一番大きかったんですがその代わりにその私がやった時もシナリオを書いたりプログラムを書いたりキャラクターデザインも私がやってたりもしたのでそういうぐらいなんかいろんなことができ,で,きできないとやっぱ小さなチームだと回らないっていうのがあります。So I, I agree with what everyone else was saying about the communication and you know just how there's pros and cons with just large teams and small teams. And back when I was um, uh, when I first started out, I only had about like four people working on the team. And when you just turn around and all your team like your all your team members are there, so it was so easy to communicate with them. And when I'm lar working with the larger uh, teams, it was very hard to get like um, uh, like what needed to be done. So we had we. We're wondering what communication tools we have to use. Like, what should we? Where do we start off? How do I communicate as fast as I could? And uh, that's why, like, you know, when I was working on a smaller team, I did the programming, I did the character design scenario, just everything. Just one person did a lot of different tasks. And so, with smaller teams, that's what's really fun, and also just it's easier to communicate with everyone on your team. And so you guys kind of brought up to something that I want to talk about a little bit further, but 
when you're making indie games, you have smaller budgets and smaller teams. Does that ever put a limit on what you want to make? Like Thomas, for example, Remedy has worked on bigger games. They've worked on like Alan Wake and Quantum Break most recently that had a full TV show in it. Is there ever a point where you're with control where you're like, I wish we could put a TV show in this? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> but it's making games is always about compromise. I mean, a creative team wants to do let's say a thousand different things and it's not just you know there's there's always more things you want to do that you have the ability of, of doing there's huge amount of technical limitations and the amount of people you have to make different features um, and I don't, I don't think most people really grasp at it there's a lot of like well why didn't they just make feature XYZ or something and they're being lazy no it's just like there's a certain amount of engineers and designers and there's only a very limited uh, amount of things you can do and it's very frustrating on our side that, you know, we play all, all the other games out there like, oh, that would, be, that would be so nice to do something like that, but we don't have 200 people or 150 million uh, to do those things. Um, so you have to get, get very, uh, very creative. Um, I mean, there's always going to be limitations and, and, and challenges, but you also need those to kind of really find what the essence of the game is. Mm -hmm. And Paul, Underworld Descendant is a game that you kind of make your own solutions. Like, how much of that is the DNA of the development team? Like, do you have to work around certain limitations? Yeah, well, part of the reason we took that creative direction is because we knew we couldn't create a massive amount of linear content. If you look at you know modern role-playing games, uh, uh, single-player uh, focus games like Fallout 4, it's just a massive amount of linear content, which is what you can do when you have you know, huge teams and a lot of time. Uh, since we didn't have that, uh, we decided to put the player out front and give them the agency and hopefully you know a, a lot of choices uh, that they could sort of tell their own story rather than we as designers laying out the story for them to explore. Um, so if it works, you know, the, the, uh, even as a single player game, you know, each player sort of tells their own you know, story that can go in divergent directions. Um, and we think that's ultimately kind of a very interesting creative space to explore. And, and we can do it as an indie studio. <laughs> Peter Lab Zero has always held this reputation of amazing hand-drawn graphics. They've held these, like, had these incredible sprites for both Indivisible and Skullgirls. Has there ever been a point where, like, if only we had more money, we could have done so much more? Or have you been able to like work around limitations with that? Um, I mean, in our case, art is actually usually not the bottleneck. It's design yeah. implement implementation. So there's definitely like a lot of times where it's like, oh, we would love to put these more monsters in, or put this in, or do this, or do that. But then it just comes down to, well, we shouldn't spend the time animating it because we don't have the time to actually implement it in the game. So yeah, um, that's always, I mean, just lack of resources to do whatever you want is always kind of the issue. Mm -hmm. Igarashi-san, you've gone from, like we said, working with publishers to now being independent. Uh, Bloodstained is fairly similar to some of your older games. Were there things that you could have done with the older games that you were worried you couldn't do with this one? Or were you able to actually like break through those limits with uh, Bloodstained? まあ、あの、今回のそのクラウドファンディングのゲームなので、あの、それについてまあ、あの、以前にできなかったものだったり、何かそのまあ、入れるようそう、まあ、例えば今回クラウドファンディングだからこそできるっていうまあ、ことって
、えー、とキックスターターであの、まあ、あの獲得したあのお金っていうのがその、えー、と割とそのいろんなところにそのリワードとかもあっていろんなところにも配布されるので開発のところに入ってくるお金っていうのがその。金額そのままではないんですがでもそれでもまあ、えー、と結構な大きな額をあの、まあ、キックスタートでいただくことができたので、まあ、そういう意味では、えー、と期待以上にちょっとあの大きなバジェットが取れたかなというふうには思っています。So um, in terms of if there was any sort of like difference between、um, you know working with a larger publisher and what we're doing right now with、um, crowdfunding is that the budget itself doesn't really change all that much. It's more, most likely like mostly just because the budget、um, for crowdfunding games,、uh, the amount that we receive, it kind of shows sort of like the demand for, for the game and a lot of publishers sort of offer to sort of increase the budget if necessary. So in terms of if it was Different from when I was working at a larger publisher, they, they, they allowed me to do like, whatever I wanted to create. So it's not that different for, for me in particular. So that kind of brings us to the, I guess, uncomfortable topic. Like, one of the things you apparently don't discuss are politics and money. We're going to discuss money because being an independent developer isn't easy, and several of the people at this table have done crowdfunded projects. So I want to talk a little bit about the Budgeting process for an indie game because I'm sure it can't be easy. How does that start? Like,、uh, let's start with you, Peter, because Indivisible was a crowdfunded project.、Uh, what is the do you work out the budget beforehand and then go to the crowdfunding place for it? Yeah, so in Indivisible's case, it's kind of a hybrid project where it's partially crowdfunded and then 505 kicked in the rest.、Um, and, you know, we'd never made a game like this before, so unfortunately, a lot of it's just best guesses. Um, you kind of do the best you can, figuring out what the schedules are going to be, how long it's going to take you to do things. And I mean, maybe it's, I think it's kind of a common indie thing, but maybe our estimates were too optimistic because everybody just is so excited to work on the thing.、Um, you know, because we recently announced a delay and that included a, a budget increase from 505.、Um, I mean, if it's not something you've done a million times before, it's, it's really hard to.、Uh, Predict what the budget's going to be, and you kind of do the best you can and、um, stretch it out as long as you can.、Um, I would say that maybe that's also, you know, AAA games to some extent because they tend to be、um, a little bit more defined start out, starting out in types, you know, genres and like feature sets and things like that, that it probably makes the budgets a little more predictable as well. Whereas, like I said, indies are kind of expected to push the envelope a little bit. And that makes the budgeting even harder. Right. Well, I mean, we didn't expect to work on Alan Wake for like seven years, but that's, that's how it turned out. But, like, what, what you said is, like, every game will present, like, challenges that you don't, no matter how experienced you are, you just kind of can't predict. Yeah.、Um, like, it never ceases to amaze me. Like, you have really veteran, veteran engineers, and they give you an estimate, like, okay, this feature probably, well, maybe we'll take. Three months to create,、uh, and then it might actually ta- take 12. And, and it's, just, it's just crazy to even have that discussion, but、uh, it, it's just, there's always so many sort of unknowns when, when making games, even if it's like a familiar、uh, genre, that it, it's, it's just very difficult to budget and, and, and schedule, which of course is a very bad thing when you work with publishers. So, Paul, here's a question How does budget look on paper? Like, is it a list of features that are like, well, we need X amount of money for this? Or is it sort of resources? Like, do we need this much money to have this many people? So, we, we tend to、uh, budget by resource. So, we figure we need a team of these people over this amount of time. Because that's, that's where 90% of your costs are the people costs on, on making, you know, developing these games.、Um, and,、uh, You know, between Warren Spector and myself, I think we've done 50 some games. So we do have the benefit of seeing a lot of different projects.、Um, so our estimates are halfway reasonable on those things. <clears throat> But it's also part of the trick is trying to、uh, assume that things are going to take longer, you're going to have surprises, and then build that in, build in some padding on the, the budget and the time and the resources.、Um, But at the end of the day,、um, you know, if you're doing an indie project, you're going to be constrained.、Um, but, you know, that, nothing truly creative happens without constraints. You need constraints from something. You know, if you have infinite money and time, 
probably not going to ever deliver anything. Um, so the pressure actually makes you make choices. You know, you have to decide what's the most important feature, uh, or what's the, you know, how many monsters do we want in Underworld Ascended? Um, and I think that, that sharpens your thinking and, and helps you sort of eliminate the chaff. So speaking of pressure, Igarachi-san, you ended up uh, crowdfunding Bloodstain, and the game recently just got a short delay to 2019. Is there pressure when you're crowdfunding a game to actually get it out at a certain time? Do you have, is that a worry that more with crowdfunding than it is with larger publishers? リリースすることってまあプレッシャーになったりしますか。はい、あの、今回。ちょっとどこに。あ、まあ、その長くなると期間が長くなると、まあちょっとそのバジェットの話が出たりとか、まあそういうのについてなんかプレッシャーとか感
Time Software uh, Development started. There's a classic book, Mythical Man Month, that talks about schedule delays and its history today, today as it was written in the 1980s. And we're thinking of like stress about the game you're making and getting it out on time. Uh, Thomas, do you ever worry that you don't have the resources to do what you want to do? Like, Control looks like a very ambitious game. Is there ever a thought where like, I hope we're going to be able to hit what we, the vision we have? Well, of course, that's always the, <laughs> always the hope. It's not like we're like, oh, let's, let's hope we make 50% of what we envision. <laughs> um, but, um, I mean, like we discussed earlier, like there's never going to be enough resources um, for, for what you want to, want to do. But then there's a real question of like, okay, we can spend this amount of month, the burn rate is this, the publisher is willing to pay this, and we think we can sell this, this many units. I mean, it's a, it's a business at the end of the day. Um, and nobody takes it harder than the actual team because they have all these things they want to do and then there's very sort of the reality of when you start designing the game you have a bunch of ideas and, and as you go along the way many of them like turn out okay they weren't that great and we spent like six months on working on that feature let's, let's cut it out and then suddenly you, you know you have to sort of compromise on other things as um, as as well so but like what Paul said is like if Constraints and restrictions are what make games great. Uh, if you would have unlimited money and time, I don't think we'd probably ever, ever ship. I think Remedy was in that position after Max Payne 2, when we sold, sold the Max Payne IP to take to one company was flush with, did we have the Euro back then? Yes, we did have the Euro <laughs> back then. Um, and then, um, you know, it, it's the hard part of like, well, let's try to figure out what the next game is. Like, and no idea was good enough after, after Max Payne. It took very, very, very long to come up with um, Alan Wake with a lot of false starts. And a lot of that was because the company could afford it. Spent years and years just to kind of slowly burn away the money. And, and then suddenly you get, oh, okay, like we're almost running out of money and then we have to take any deal we can, we can get. So hopefully we've learned from that. Um, yeah, it's just, it, it, is, it is very challenging. The team always wants more resources than, than, than it, it, it can get. You just have to hit that sweet spot of like the amount of features and, and the time we can spend and the amount of money we can afford. And Peter, on like a kind of macro scale, what kind of decision making goes into can we hit these features or do we have to strip something out to make this game or you actually just end up releasing this game for consumers? Um, I mean, it's it's a constant process. There's, you know, and then it, I mean, sometimes forced by deadlines or possibly missing deadlines. Um, or just, like I said, the realization that, okay, the resources aren't here to do that, the thing that we wanted. And um, I don't know if people know this, but generally, Every developer looks as a, at a game that they released, even if they're proud of it, as like being completely unfinished and not what they wanted. Like all you see are the things that you wanted to do that you didn't get to do, and you know people can tell you like, oh, I love this and this, and you're like, yeah, but I wanted to do that instead. Or, but we also had this other plan, and like, I don't know. It's of course it's great when people like your game, but it, that's always in the back of your mind. <laughs> and you know that kind of goes into kind of the, I guess the feature cutting you know, process as well, because it's like, well, what are the things that we're gonna have to cut that we're gonna regret the least? Is it comforting to know that, like, when we talked about the, the games that inspired you earlier, like, is it comforting to know that they probably didn't get done what they wanted to get? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, but I, I'm sure I would have the exact same conversation with, you know, with them about it, you know. I don't know, maybe there are like 10 other time periods in Chrono Trigger that they didn't get to do that it's like, it's all sound really cool, but, mm -hmm. you know. And the games are and never done, they're just sort of taken away from you and then, then shaped pretty much. Right. So the reason we're here is to talk about single player games at, like in the first place and how much we love them and how much they've influenced us and more importantly, how they're going to affect the game development industry in the future. So right now, the common wisdom, as we talked about, was single-player games don't make money. That uh, multiplayer games are where the real money is, that everyone's trying to make a Battle Royale game because that's going to sell 25 million copies while the single-player game might tap out at four. 
everyone here on this table is making a single player game right now. So we want to talk a little bit about like why exactly you would choose to. Because what everyone says, every stock analyst says, every reset era poster says that single player games are where the money is, where multiplayer is. Why would you choose to say they control? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, the single player category is pretty wide, right? I mean, there's very, very different single player games, whether it's made by three people, whether it's made by, you know, hun hundreds of people. Um, and we, we talk a lot about this in the last five years of our remedy, because what we've done is, is uh, single player games are very sort of very very linear um, experiences you know you play it through the game and then that's that's pretty much it uh, personally I, 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 I like that as a destiny addict I kind of like a game that I can actually play through in like eight hours and then put it on the shelf or well put it back on the hard drive how do I say <laughs> that I don't know um, but it's I don't think like single player is not going anywhere but like there's that certain type of single player game that's just and if it's something like a god of war where it's like five years and hundreds of people that's from a financial standpoint is almost impossible to make unless you are like a first party studio where your mandate is to sell the platform like you can almost make a loss on the game as long as it, it it's an awesome game and kind of brings an audience uh, to the console, but as, as we're all independent companies, uh, we, we won't survive um, that way. But then there's also a very real thing of like, like, like we spent over five years of one break, and it was a very tough, tough game to to pull off. And, and like every game is also the kind of like a reaction to the previous game. Like, okay, like let's let's not scale back on ambition, but let's scale a little bit back on like production and like ship something that's. You know, a little bit, little bit faster, more lean and lean and mean, and that's not just necessary because that's what the market wants. It's like actually what we want to be uh, want to be doing. But I always bring up the example of like, well, games pretty much cost the same the last 20 years. They're actually probably cheaper than what they used to be, but the cost of making games has gone up something like 10, 15 fold. So I mean, the math clearly doesn't add up when the audience is also pretty much. You know, one generation PlayStation does well, another generation Nintendo kicks ass, but the sort of number of consoles out there, kind of the ballpark tends to be the same, so that's that's a hard equation to work out. Um, so you just gotta be very, very smart about it, and, and just, also we wanna be responsible, right? We wanna be making games that sell, that ensure that the company stays around and we can make the next game, so. And Paul, like, why was, Underworld is obviously a spiritual successor to Ultima Underworld. Why, why make an immersive sim a single player game today? Um, well, I think <clears throat> uh, we, we weren't as a panel, we couldn't come up with any real uh, statistics on you know, the sales of single player versus multiplayer. They, they may be out there. But our sense is that single player games have continued to hold their own as a category. Certainly multiplayer games are, you know, have continued to grow the overall market and bring in new players. Uh, but I don't, our take is that single player games aren't going away. And you know, there's been some pretty successful single player games in recent years, you know, whether it's Grand Theft Auto V or you know, the, the Last of Us series or Uncharted 4. And those games have done pretty well. Um, and I think you know, to, your, to your point, uh, Thomas, the uh, platform manufacturers want to make sure that there are really good single player experiences available, you know, narrative, story driven, because there's an audience for them. And, um, you know, people have been telling stories since they gathered around, you know, fires. And so I think that's, that's always going to continue. Um, for us, in terms of immersive sims, um, what we're trying to do in terms of single players is create these, you know, player authored experiences uh, where it's not the same story that everyone's going through. And so, you know, when, when you play, uh, uh, you know, uh, a story-driven game that's, you know, a built-in narrative at the end of it, you've had the same experience that, you know, 100,000 or, or millions of other people have. And if you watch a Twitch stream, of it, it's gonna be pretty much identical to everybody else. Our, our thought is that, you know, if, if, if 100 different people play the game and they have 100 different experiences, 
um, that that's kind of an interesting take on it, you know, authoring your own experience. Um, and it gives, you know, potentially the reason to come back and, and try it again because the second time through, third time through, you'll have a different experience. I know, you know, Warren Spector with the Deus Ex game, he was finding players who would play it, you know, five or ten times through because it offered essentially three different paths to explore. With immersive stims, we're trying to now offer, you know, dozens and dozens of ways to play it with no right way. So if it works, it'll be good. Peter Lab Zero kind of started with multiplayer with Skullgirls and you kind of made a decision there to go from a fighting game to a single player RPG. Why did you choose that? Um, so first actually I want to talk a little bit about the question in general. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, the biggest hits in the industry. Like I think actually there's this belief that multiplayer does better because of blockbuster chasing. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of single player games that make money and do well. It's just they don't have the upper cap of earnings that a runaway multiplayer success can. Um, and I think that, tend, that way of thinking tends to distort a lot of the, just like the way company businesses think about games. Because um, I mean, the other side of it, there are you know, hundreds and hundreds of multiplayer games that come out that never find an audience and don't do anything. Um, so I think the idea that multiplayer is some like magic bullet is actually like false and it's just you know kind of like stock market um, blockbuster chasing. Um, as for us, you know, um, our team, uh, you know, we made a very hardcore competitive fighting game. Um, there's an upper cap that that genre has in terms of you know uh, sales, um, but also like our team just. Uh, we only have a handful of people that actually play it, like actively like play that type of game. Like we all like fighting games, but none of us are, you know, tournament grade players with the exception of a handful. Um, and so yeah, Indivisible came about because, uh, you know, we were pitching games and we wanted to pitch uh, something a little different, something that the, the team could kind of give more active feedback to and had more experience with. Um, and yeah, one publisher asked for a game that was kind of like Child of Light, and uh, you know that's a platformer with a RPG battle system. And yeah, we kind of took our own spin on that and ended up with Indivisible. Cool. Igarashi-san, there you've made some multiplayer games before. Actually, there was a uh, multiplayer Castlevania that, by the way, is super cool. Why did you decide to go with Bloodstained to be a single-player game? にもちょっとあのマルチのゲームを出したと思うんですけど、まあなぜあのこの今回もシングルプレイでやらせていただけてますかと思ってます。はい、あのまあ僕が作ってきたゲームっていうのがまずシングルプレイヤーがすごい好
Let's see. Mm -hmm. Paul, you were telling me earlier a story about system shock and this exact thing. So why don't you help relay that story now? Yeah, when we were uh, developing System Shock 2, which came out in 1999, so a few years ago, um, Electronic Arts was our publisher, and at that point in time, they were already of the belief that a single-player game, narrative game, they, they were questioning that that had, you know, could get real market traction. So they pretty much required us to do a multiplayer co-op mode, which we stuffed in in kind of the 11th hour. Uh, as I recall, it even came out as a patch, I think, so a little past midnight. But um, we didn't stab the time and resources to make the multiplayer mode robust, yeah, so it was more of an afterthought. And of course, the game was designed pretty much at core to be a single player experience, and so trying to play that co-op was didn't quite work either. Um, and I ended up compromising. I mean, we could have spent those resources to scramble and create the co-op mode, or just making a better single player experience. And I think there are very few games that are great as both single player and multiplayer. I mean, it's not some, but it's, that's really hard to do. And one, you know, thing as an indie studio is that trying to do both of those things at the same time is probably crazy. So, so we're, I got the 10 minute warning just now, and I want to get a chance to give you guys a chance to ask some questions. So why don't we line up by the microphone over here, uh, and I might pepper in some questions, do some follow-ups, what do you guys ask them? We're not gonna have a ton of time for them, so I'm sorry if you're in the line and we don't have a chance, but let's uh, start on this side, right over here. Hi, uh, <coughs> I wanna ask uh, regarding... Uh, uh, real quick, what's your name? Oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, my name is Pedro. Right. Um, uh, I wanna ask uh, regarding uh, you know, the users make their own narrative in the game, how people make, uh, discover their own ways to play a game. Uh, do you ever find that, or how does it feel when people find a way to play your game in a way you never expected it to play, or they customize their experience? Like, you know, Quantum Break, uh, you can use several different abilities in combat. It's like, oh, I'm gonna, I like these abilities way more, and I'm like, oh, maybe these aren't the abilities I decided to use, or I would have used them that, but, or, you know, just playing games in interesting ways that you never expected. Thank you. I think that's, it's, it's awesome. Like, it's awesome when people, I mean, I think Quantum Ray was pretty, pretty limited compared, especially what, what Paul has been uh, cooking over, over the years. But like, it, it's, it's fascinating to see where players uh, uh, take their game and definitely moving forward we want to kind of build games that provide more, more opportunity for players to just play the way they want and express themselves more. I mean, that, that's the unique capability of, you know, gaming as a media compared to, you know, films and books. It's not linear. And just so to, you know, bring in the player, engage them and have them, you know, be the agent of their own uh, destiny is, uh, is what seems most powerful to us in trying to explore that space. Uh, our litmus test on whether we're, we're making an immersive sim right is when people test the game and they come up with solutions and we say, scratch our head and say, I couldn't imagine, imagine you could even do that. No one thought of doing it that way. That's as cool as it. Yeah, All right. I don't know if uh, I think that. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go with this side of the room. Hi there. Um, I'm Michael. Uh, I just had a question. So you spoke a lot to the dichotomy between indie games and the AAA games in the way that indie games will push the envelope, or where AAA will generally stay pretty safe. Are there any exceptions that come to mind where you guys like, like actually like respect? You're like, wow, that th these this AAA studio is still like pushing that envelope. I'm really curious what you're going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that happens a lot. Um, I do tend to think they probably happen more, um, kind of like what Thomas was saying at, uh, you know, at like Sony um, and platform holders because they're. Like the games can be lost leaders for their platforms. Like if they get people to buy, um, you know, God of War took a giant risk going in a completely different direction, for example. And obviously, you know, um, they have, uh, you know, Shadow of the Colossus is not at all like something you would expect to see out of a typical AAA game. Um, so yeah, but I, I tend to think you see those more from platform holders, just because they don't have the same budgetary calculus that, like, an EA would. Yeah, I mean, Sony's put out things like really left-field stuff like Parappa the Rapper and yeah. Beep Ribbon and, and these, which kind of 
build build the brand and as Pete said it's okay they don't necessarily need to make uh, mon money on those but that's not the reality for the rest of us and uh, this side of the room uh, my name is Carissa and I just got a really quick question uh, what advice do you have for brand new developers thank so you for well. saving me that time because I was gonna ask that question too so Guys, go ahead. I'm sure you have some notes on this already. Um, well, in, in some ways, uh, I can't give a short short answer on this. So, back like when Remedy started in '95, you had to build everything yourself. There was no Unreal Engine, no nothing. All the tech had to be built yourself. Uh, 3ds Max and Photoshop cost in the tens of thousands, um, and now you can get I don't know what 20 bucks gets you Unreal or something like that in a month and, and Unity is almost almost free so in some ways it's so much easier um, to, to get into making games uh, than, than ever before there's a lot more sort of tools for communication where it's slack or, 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 or things like that and you can create a game these days without really having to be a hardcore engineer that kind of milks everything out of the hardware and, and all, all that like the tools are so good and the engines are so or the creative tools are so good that it's a lot easier to sort of get up and running, but that's not to say that making games is very easy or running a company is very easy. Those are very, very difficult things. But don't be too discouraged. <laughs> Paul, Peter, any, either of you have advice? Well, if you've never made a game before, um, it can be helpful to go work for you know a studio that's been very successful, done some great games, and sort of go through a project. You know, there's nothing like completing a project from, you know, start to, to finish to give you the whole sense of what it takes to do, do a game. I think, you know, a, a lot of indie studios, they started with people who were working with established studios uh, and then decided they wanted to chase their own vision. Uh, it's not to say you can't do it entirely, you know, from scratch, but it just, it's, it's a way to get a leg up. Yeah, I actually really agree with Paul on that one. Um, you know, as imperfect as our industry is or any industry is, like, there are, you know, reasons why things are the way they are, and going through a project is probably the, the best way to learn all of that stuff and kind of get your legs for what's going to come, and it's going to be way harder probably when you do it on your own, but at least you'll have, you know, some idea of what's coming your way. So just kind of, um, you know, uh, on top of what everyone else said, um, it's very important to um, finish the project. Whatever you started, whatever, um, you know, a small project, large project, whatever it is, you have to make it until the very end. And that's probably one of the biggest experience that um, I've also learned when I was making games. So it's very important that you finish a project that you started. Uh, that's bad timing for that answer because we're going to have to only do one more question so we can't finish this project we started because they'll kick us out of the room. But let's go with you right over here. Hi, my name is Tomaz. I have a quick question about the gray area between single player and multiplayer games. Since we're talking a lot about the difference between them, I wanted to broach the topic of something that they can have in common when you have a multiplayer game that's a single player experience. One recent game that comes to mind is the Original Sin 2. Uh, there's a lot of cooperative experiences that I look for in single player style games because I enjoy being able to play games with other people as a social experience with people that I enjoy spending my time with and not necessarily sitting on a couch for 10 to 20 to 50 to 100 hours just doing something by myself. Uh, sitting in you know, some voice chat just talking so I can have someone else in my ear and I'm just sitting alone in a room. <laughs> so what's your thoughts on bridging the gap between single player and multiplayer, creating cooperative experiences that offer a more, not necessarily linear storytelling type experience, but something that's more like, well, thinking about Divinity Original Sin 2, uh, an RPG that you can play with other people, and sort of creating a game kind of like a tabletop gaming experience where you give them a tabletop to play on. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, again, there, there are some examples of games that sort of bridge between, you know, multiplayer, especially small team, you know, two, four player multiplayer and, uh, you know, a single player, so we have a, maybe have a single player campaign on what is at core two, four player game that have worked pretty well. Uh, it's hard to do, and I think that's an area people are working on and trying to figure out, you know, how that all might, you know, how, where you take that forward. On that note, we are out of time. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, Pat, for allowing us to host this panel here. Uh, if you see any of us, please feel free to say hi and ask us questions there. But thank you guys. Uh, thank you again. I have some swag if, if anybody's into that. You guys no. are into swag. Come People on. Laughing. They're not into it. Oh, no. <laughs>